This week, at the top of my gratitude list is you. I'm so thankful that you are here today. So sit down, make yourself at home. We are glad that you're at first. Especially if you're joining us online, we welcome you if this is your first time or your 50th time. And for those of you who are here live in flesh, we are glad that you are here. I'm pleased to welcome my daughter and my son back from college. It's great to have them back too. Uh, Lizzie flew in, Nathan drove in. And so uh, this meant that Don and I were going to make our first trip to pick Lizzie up from the airport. And of course, there's one way to pick people up from the airport. Uh, you go to the curb and you pick them up, right? Well, Donna, my beloved wife, said, you know, I'd like to go in. I'd like to surprise her. And I was like, okay, well, but we'd, we'd have to pay to park. She said, you could drop me off. I thought about that. So that would mean she would get to surprise her. I was like, no, no, that's not going to work. We're going to park. We're going to park. But we don't know how to do it. So we decided we were gonna make a pass. We, we drove and we saw where you normally pick up and drop off at the curb. And we looked around and we saw that there was garage, there was covered parking and economy parking over the, by the cell phone lot. Again, I'm familiar with the cell phone lot as well. Good place to go. So we made our second pass and Donna's pretty sure about where we're needing to go at this point. I'm trying to decide between covered and garage, you know, $7 or $9. And so I needed another pass. So I circled us again. More on that story in a minute. It's the holidays, right? So there's conflict in the air, or can be. Maybe you're planning to be alone for this Thanksgiving. You are planning for a big group. Or maybe it's you talking to your cat or talking to even that spouse that you still give a hard time even though they're not there anymore. We need kind of a conflict holiday guide, don't we? Of how to get through this season, whatever it's going to look like for us. And James steps up to the plate to offer us just such a conflict guide. In this series called Likeness, we've been looking deeply at the whole letter of James, this doubting brother of Jesus. And for the last three weeks, we've dived in on a little mini-series on conflict. And each week, James has given us a little bit more. So if you remember, just a couple of weeks ago, we started with the tongue. And we realized that in terms of conflict, we're going to have to become students of our tongue, observers of our tongue, able to pilot our bodies by how we pay attention to our tongues. And then last week, we looked at the second in this series. We looked at how we would manage what flows out of our life. The color of the water, if you know what I mean, flowing out of our lives. Is it coming from above? Is it coming with gentleness and peace and yielding? Or is it coming from below? Is it focused on me, myself, and I? A very base level wisdom. Which brings us to where we're at for today. This next phase where James gives us an answer, and, and I have to tell you, you're going to have to be dialed in. Are you, are you dialed in? We're going to read his answer to where conflict comes from. And here's how you're going to help me dial in. I'm going to get everybody back on their feet again, those that are able or willing. Otherwise, if you're watching online, just get your heart, get your eyes tuned in, your ears ready to receive this from James chapter 4, verse 1. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something, and you don't have it, so you commit murder. You covet something, and you can't obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your own pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that Scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? 
But God gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God gives, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in this passage, James gives us an answer to where the source of conflict is. He tells us its origin point. And the answer is you, me. We are the source of the conflict. Now, of course, we know that he's wrong, right? This is absolutely not true. The source of the conflict is uh, with Donna, right? The source of the conflict is maybe in your house over the remote control where you want to hold the mighty scepter. You want to choose what's on. You want to determine how quickly or slowly you go through the commercials. The source of the conflict is in the parking lot. I mean, you know you're going to be in parking lots later this week. Someone whips in to get your parking lot, and you turn that horn into a war beat drum. <clears throat> the source of the conflict is not me. It's that stupid person who got my parking lot who takes the remote control. Or what about in the kitchen? You probably don't have an opinion about how things should be stirred or how things should be cleaned or what should be left on the counter and what should be put into the refrigerator, right? The source of the conflict is not me, it's the other person. It's their fault. And yet James looks at us straight in the eye and gives us a sock right on the chin and says, you are the source of the conflict. Well, I don't know about this. And if you look at the verses very clearly, he, he levels us quite consistently that conflict is about a thwarted desire within us where something that we want, we don't get. And so if you look in verse two, he gives three very power packed phrases that express this. You want something that you don't have. And so you're willing to kill somebody for it. And you think, oh, no, I, I wouldn't kill somebody over the kitchen or over a parking lot. Surely James is speaking metaphorically. Is he? Is it metaphor until it's not? The next thing, the next phrase, the second one of the three is you covet something, you want something, and you can't obtain it. And so you dispute and you have conflicts and you try to get what you want through words. The third one is a little bit different. It's a little different phrase, but still packs a punch and packs meaning because it expresses to us something that we don't have. And the reason why we don't have it is we don't ask God. We're not asking God. And even more, what we're asking God for, we really just want to spend on our own pleasures, on our own self. And so we don't get it. Now, this is pretty easy. If we look at the first two phrases, uh, preachers can fill in the blank here. You want something, you can't have it. So preachers, we tend to do the obvious things. You want some money, you want a job, a partner, and you can't have this thing, this person. And so you're frustrated, you're upset. Well, that, that could be included. It definitely is, these physical, tangible objects. But I also want us to think about intangible things. Is there not a desire inside some of us just for a little bit of respect? I mean, can somebody notice me on the job? Give me a raise or a promotion? I just want a little respect. Or what about appreciation? It would be nice if someone would thank me every once in a while. You know, say something nice around the house or in the neighborhood, with all the work that I do, we just want a little bit of appreciation, a little bit of recognition. Can I take this intangible a little bit further? Sometimes we want something good like justice. There's some atrocity, some 
something that's wrong in the world where some people have housing, other people are don't, don't have housing. There's some gender inequality. People are paid differently, a class difference, a social difference of some kind. And we want to see some justice brought to bear, especially for our side that might be on the lower side, right? The overlooked side. So these are intangible, but they point us to something that we want that we can't have. And it's at this point that things can get difficult. I mean, we've seen it. Let's protest for peace. And then a fight breaks out. Can you be a peaceful protester and be ready to strangle someone? Or you come to a gun rights demonstration and you're upset with someone that doesn't share your view of gun rights and so you shoot them. How quickly does our desire to prove our point get us into violence and get us into difficulties? So, here's the point that I want you to hear from James. This overarching point, the danger, what is at threat in these conflicts is not whether or not you're correct. The danger is not you winning the argument like we talked about last week. That's not the threat. There's no external threat. There's no moral issue that you are supposed to solve. That's not the danger. And you say, okay, well, what is the danger? If, if we can't be right, if we can't correct all of these things, what's the danger? The danger, according to James, is that we don't recognize the authority of God. We're not willing to submit to God, to draw near to God, to recognize that God is an authority over us. Now here, if your friends and family or you're listening online, and you're like, I don't know about this God thing. I mean, I'm checking out church. I'm here with family or whatever. And we might hear God and say, oh, I don't know if I believe in that. Well, just put a, put a bracket around that a little bit. Most thinking individuals do not assume that the world revolves around them. They know that they are not God. And they recognize that there is other authorities in their life. They can't do just whatever they want. And so before you dismiss God, this is, this is about dismissing that there are other authorities bigger than you. Other realities, other more important people, more important situations than ourselves. That we are not the sum of the universe. And so our being right is not the issue. The issue is, do we recognize authority, any authority that is beyond ourselves? Something bigger than us. And so when we look at these things, if the self is just our exclusive point of reference, that we only choose what we do based upon ourselves, folks, you're, you're not going to fit in society. You're not going to be able to stay married. There aren't going to be many friends that want to be around you if it's all about you. Well, those are the first two phrases that James mentions. There's another one where he says, you don't have what you want, this inner world within you, this inner conflict. You don't have what you want because you don't ask. And if you do ask, you're asking so that you can spend it upon yourself. Now again, preachers could step in and throw all kinds of things in here. You want your own desires met. So maybe those are physical desires, sexual desires. Maybe they're chemical desires where you just need an escape. Maybe that's legal. Maybe it's illegal. But you need some pleasure to take you away from the circumstance, from the situation. Well, this presses us a little bit further. In fact, since most of you are Christians, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you even more uncomfortable. Can I, can I give you some examples that will make us a bit more uncomfortable? We want this thing, and we want it for ourselves but we don't want it for others. So with Christians, sometimes what we want is fairness for our religion. We want special privilege for Christianity, but we do not want that for another religion. We don't want that for another persuasion. The very same things that we might want for ourselves, we dismiss or deny for other people. Is that one uncomfortable enough? Well, let me go even deeper. What if we 
as Christians, say, I only want this understanding of marriage, this understanding of sexuality, and everybody else I'm going to legislate and dismiss. We want this for ourselves, but we don't want it for anyone else. Now are we sweating around the collar? James doesn't pull back any punches. When we want these things for ourselves and not for others, we have to give thought and pause. Now, in the letter that he's writing, the circumstance is a Jewish community. It's a Jewish Christian community. They're, they're poor. They're oppressed by rich people. And if you look in James chapter 1, verse 19 through 12, you'll see that there's this poverty situation. The poor are feeling oppressed and they want to even do violence against the rich. And yet, oddly enough, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, whenever rich people show up, they're putting them on the front row. They're pandering to them. They want these rich people in there. And yet, even though the rich people are oppressing them, they're still trying to reach out to them. There's confusion about wanting something for ourselves, but not for others. Okay, so let me, let me point this out. If we say what James is saying in reverse, if this thing that I want for others, that they might get, I have to be okay with them getting what I would want. And maybe the reason that I don't get the justice or the insight that I want is because I don't want that same for others. I'm thinking of myself as the sun in the center of the galaxy focused in upon myself, and I'm not. I think even outsiders would agree and would know that the world does not revolve around them. Any more than Christians should understand that the world revolves around them. The added challenge for an insider is that not only do we recognize we're not the center of the universe, that God is, but we're also, as believers, submitting to God. We're submitting to the authority of God. And if you look in verses 6 and following, we really get down to what James has to offer to us in a practical way, ways that we might live in this world because he invites us into this life of humility. A life where we submit and surrender to God and draw near to God and humble ourselves. In verse 10, these humble people, people that have surrendered to God, are exactly the kind of trustworthy people that we want in charge. We need people who are humble who are willing to lead for the good of other folks, who are able to see beyond themselves and to see for the good of others. You see, the goal is not for us to win, to win the argument. The goal is not for you and I to defeat all evil or to save every person, as striking as that might sound. God is the one who defeats evil. God is the one who saves all people. What we do, and this sometimes gets confused with evangelism, is we bear witness. We point to what God has done. We have control over ourselves and how we will work against the evil that is in our life. Let me just tell you about the world that God created. A world that he invites us into. God created this world. He placed us in it and was willing to come and enter it in the form of Jesus. And we didn't really like all of Jesus' theology. We didn't like the people that he hung out with. Tax collectors, non-Jews, prostitutes, sinners of all kinds. We didn't like that. We didn't like the way he kind of stre stretched the rules and didn't follow the Sabbath. And so the world, religious, irreligious, altogether executed Jesus. And God shows us that he's willing to take that, not to be right, but to go to death to show the kind of love that he has for us. And you know what God does? The story doesn't end with Jesus' death. Because when God manifests humility in Jesus, that is exactly the kind of life that God will exalt or lift up. When we humble ourselves, God lifts us up. That's what verse 10 says about humility. So as we look about our own life, and we recognize that God lifted up Jesus, gave him life again, 
and allowed the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of us that we might carry forward that same kind of love, that same kind of humility into the world, that is the world that we're looking for. Well, in the last half of this sermon, I really want to focus in on expanding a word that's one of my favorites from James. It's called double-minded. It's two words hyphenated. Double-minded. Pretty easy to define that one, right? Having two minds, being split off in two directions. He gives lots of examples. He'll say, you adulterers. Did that kind of catch you off guard when I said that? You adulterers, where you have one commitment, but your allegiance is torn off another direction. This double-mindedness is not the kind of life that submits and surrenders to God. It's not the kind of life that is humble and living out the life before God. Instead, whenever we're driving, we are in the car, in the privacy of our own closed up windows, insulting all the bad drivers around us. We are in the house, belittling our spouse with verbal abuse as we tear them down. We are in the workplace or at school, ripping down and tearing apart, maligning the character of other people, that they're not worth it, that they're two-faced, that they're not a good person. Whenever we carry out these kind of lives and then take a little nod toward God, we are not showing humility, we're showing pride. Those are actually pride moves when you tear other people down. God calls us into a different kind of life. In fact, James says, quoting from Proverbs 3.34, God works against the proud. God is an enemy of the proud, the arrogant, those that would lift themselves up because they are displacing God and they're not living in the real world whatsoever. Instead, James invites us into the humble path. Is God going to give grace to the proud, to the arrogant? James says, yes, God gives grace to the arrogant and the proud, but he gives all the more grace to the humble, Those that will take the lower path. Those that will say, I'm going to bless that driver. I'm going to honor my spouse. I'm not going to speak evil of anyone, even if it's true, because I'm learning to bind up my tongue, even begin to restrain my facial expressions as the war, this internal conflict inside of us, the internal cravings that we're fighting with begins to take form in a new way to get new control, where judgment is not what we're doing. You know, God didn't ask you to be a judge. Didn't ask you to be a judge. We'll we'll look at that even next week. He didn't ask you to be assistant manager to the judge, or if you want, assistant to the manager, however you want to look at that. He doesn't need another judge. You're off. He invites you to let him be God, and you get to be you in submission, in surrender to God. Now, if we look at at this description that that, that James is painting for us, it's something of a pretty vivid snapshot. In fact, I I was joking with Amanda in first service. Sometimes people ask about a good memory verse or a good theme for VBS. Look at James 4.9. Sometimes I'll just jokingly say, oh yeah, James 4.9, that's a great one. Let me refresh your memory on it. Lament and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. I could just see the artwork right now. That's a beautiful verse. Now it's rough, but it's like a selfie picture that we take of ourselves, where we realize that we've been living in pride and arrogance. We've been lifting up our opinion over others, and it's time to go the path of humility. And James says that path is through repentance, where you say, I'm not God. I've been acting like it. I've been living this way of assuming that I'm God. And so maybe, maybe you need to go down to Hobby Lobby and get that verse of lamenting and weeping and wailing, laughter, turn and joy, and put that up as a new Christian artwork for you of how we might live lives of repentance instead of divided loyalty, living like an adulterer, being split in the mind. Thankfully, James gives us a couple of 
word pictures that I think help us. Three in particular that I think will help us hang on to this and hold on to it. So if we've got this internal war going inside of us, he says, wash your hands, you sinners. There's a time when we need to get the blood off our hands. Wash the grime of the dirty money away. Let go of the weapons that we hold in our hands, whether they're verbal or physical. We wash our hands, even if that's just a mean hand gesture, even if it's a gesture that's just like a word you can't quite say. We wash our hands. We let it go. We clean up our act. Purify your hearts, says James. Purify your hearts. Now, you might think, okay, does that mean I need to go on a, you know, a low-carb diet? I need to get my ticker in order? Okay, yeah, we could, we could, that's an important thing, your organ. But whenever the heart is discussed here, it's meant in that ancient sense, the, the center of the human being, the seat of the human will, where you make decisions. It's that kind of executive center. Your heart needs to be purified, where you're giving the direction of your heart to God. And then finally... Be single-minded, not double-minded, not split-minded, but single-minded in your focus, not fickle, not giving a nod to God and then running to the chemical, not giving a nod to God and then running to the mistress, not running to God and then, "Ah, I'm just going to gossip, I'm going to share these things that are not mine to say, I'm going to give this information out that's not mine to even know, let alone to share. We can't keep living in this split world. Instead, we're we're drawing near to God, kind of like your pet that curls up in your lap, kind of like a young child that wants to be surrounded in a hug from you. How do you, with your life, mind and hand, heart, come and let God surround you with what God is intending? Now, there's a lot that we can't control in this world about wars or issues. But James looks at us and says, the source of the conflict is in you. It's in your heart. We can control ourselves. We don't have to worry about others, even if they have the remote control. Even if they've stolen that coveted parking lot that we want, even if they have no knowledge what to do in the kitchen. They're doing it all wrong. We can control our reaction, how we respond to that situation. Well, I did leave us kind of circling at the airport, didn't I, on the front end? Sorry about that. We made one pass to see what was going on. A second pass where I was kind of needing a little bit more and Donna was ready, and I'd, I'd sorted it down to, to two. There was the $7 option, that had partial hours and the $9 all day option. And so on the third pass, Donna was very patient with me, I made the turn and we got in there and we parked. And you know what, it was the right call. We had so much fun surprising Lizzie and welcoming her. It was very exciting. It didn't matter how much it cost. And yet sometimes we know what's right, right? We know what ought to happen. And I'll just to be fair to myself, when I went to give them the ticket, and I was pretty excited to see what it'd be. Do you know what they said? That'll be $9. Like, wait a second, we were just here for this 45 minutes. Well, that's in the garage lot. So note to you, if you want to do the garage thing, do it in the garage and not the covered parking. The reason I tell that story is that it would be very natural for me and Donna in that moment to stake out our turf, right? We do that occasionally, where we know who's right. We know where the escalators are. We know how many staircases they are. We know what the best parking situation is, right? It would be easy to square off, but instead, in that situation, I'm thankful to us, to both of us, we deferred to one another. We were flexible with one another. We understood that it didn't matter whether or not we were right, we were gonna be together. This is what James calls us into, into an understanding that it doesn't matter if you're right or if you win the argument. It matters if you know 
where the authority of God is in your life and that you are under the authority of God. Others of you might be concerned, you know, what did you do for Nathan? Okay, well, Don and I both stood by the curb as he drove up. So we, we welcomed both children equally. In your life this week, please take a breath. Please realize a much bigger frame for your conflicts. Let's pray. O great eternal one, who has given life to all that we can see and all that we can't see. God, we surrender ourselves to you. We confess what should be obvious, that we are not God, that we're not the most important thing in the universe. And we confess that you are God. And we ask, Lord, that you will help us, help us in our goings and our comings, that our conflict will fade away, it will vaporize as we seek to exalt you and lift you up, that you be glorified in every way. And that the outcomes that we want, that we're so desperate for, the desires of our heart that split us in two and break our minds in half, God, we give them to you, knowing that you reign supreme. And we ask all this through Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.